Hey folks, my name is Josh Seidman of Rugged Ridge Forest, and this is Hildy, our Percheron standard bred mare. Uh, horse logging and draft power in general is uh, an important value of ours at Rugged Ridge Forest, and keeping that tradition alive is uh, part of the reason that we do what we do. And I figured a good way to introduce you all to that would be to kind of demystify the different components and practices at play while working with the horses. And so uh, I hope that uh, you'll enjoy seeing what we do. Step off. Whoa. Oh, good girl. Good girl. Easy. So this is Hildy's bridle with the bit. The bit is kind of what transfers the energy from the driver to the horse and kind of steers the animal. Um, you want to be gentle on the bit. The horses have a very sensitive mouth, and even though this is kind of an aggressive way of directing them, it allows us to really lightly pull on the wrist and to get uh, a response or at least communicate with the animal. The horse is capable of pulling you down the road by its mouth. It's also very cold out, so I'm actually going to stuff this bit inside my jacket while I tack her out, start to warm it up a little bit for her because nobody's excited to get a cold piece of steel in their mouth on a cold day. So we're gonna put that right there and later on you'll see why. So it's important to clean your horses off before you put your equipment on them. A few strokes in the right direction are really all it takes. You know, starting at the front and working your way down and back. Once your horse has just been lightly brushed off of all that dirt and salt and grime on her, we're gonna take out the hoof pick and we're just gonna clean her hooves. There's a pretty aggressive shoe on as well. We welded a couple cleats on here for the snow and the ice to give her a little bit of traction. And he also has a rubber snow pad. Um, that helps the big pads of snow to flake off while she's working. Here we have the collar pad and the horse collar. And what the horse collar does is it transfers the power of the animal from the shoulder into the harness. So what really the horse does is she pushes with her shoulders into this part of the collar. It transfers the power to the hames, which is a steel bar that wraps around the collar. And then attached to the hames, that steel bar, are the tugs. And those allow her to pull. So a horse really can't pull, it can only push. So she pushes against the collar, creating a pull. Um, it's the most important part. Uh, this was very carefully fitted to her and um, the collar pad really just makes it slightly more comfortable for her. Again, she's, you know, thousands of pounds of force are being applied to this. And so it's important that it fits well and that it's comfortable. It's always good to let a horse inspect what you're doing. Uh, it makes it less spooky. If they can touch it, then they know they can't fear it. They're not going to be able to touch a lion in the wild. Uh, and so putting their nose on something is a good way for them to kind of get comfortable with it. But Hildy, she's known collars and pads longer than I've known her. So it's not something that she balks at generally. I like to stretch out my collar a little bit. That way when it goes around her head and neck, it's not a tight fit. I also kind of, this is the way the collar is going to fit on the horse. I put it on upside down. That way the wider part of the collar can get around her eyes and her ears more comfortably. Then once it gets to the narrow part of her neck, then I can spin it around. But uh, another thing is I'll put it around my neck and then I kind of make eye contact with her. And that way she's kind of focused on me and not feeling nervous about what's going on with the uh, collar here. So she's a very good girl. Look at her go. Tight spin. And then while it's nice and high in the neck, slip the pad through. A good fitting collar, you should be able to stick your whole hands down the throat of the collar. And that just means that she's going to be able to breathe. Now I'm going to lift the collar up and just get all of her beautiful mane out from under it and out from beneath. Slide it back. And as you can see, the power from her shoulders is going to get transferred to the pad, to the collar. Now I can grab the rest of the harness. And I always like to kind of slip my hand under the harness and keep it in order the way it goes on. If you get the harness twisted up, it becomes a chore putting it on and off. And so if you can keep it all kind of 
uh, in line, then it's going to go on much easier. So now that it's on, let's start at the back here. And this is the britchin or breechin. This allows uh, the harness to, to break a cart or something that's coming up after her. Um, if you had the shafts on the harness, they're going to hook onto the end of the breeching and whatever force is going forward will push against her rear. So we're just going to flip her tail over the breeching. That's the first step. And then we can pull it a little bit forward. You want the uh, retainer here to kind of sit on the high point of her butt. And they call this the saddle, even though it's not the kind of saddle you ride a horse with. It's the portion that kind of holds the assembly up on the horse. And then here we have the hames, which are the stainless steel bars that are going to transfer the load from the tugs to the hames to the collar. And so we're just going to get the hames set up in the groove of the collar, and then we're going to tighten it down. The hames should be the tightest strap on the harness. This is the one that it really can't loosen up, otherwise the horse is gonna get hurt and uh, it's gonna slip off and cause a lot of discomfort. So I'm gonna push my shoulder into this part of it as I pull on the strap and then work it down as, as tightly and as deeply as I can into the grooves of the uh, collar. There we go. And as you can see, it's deeply set in the grooves of the collar. She still has room to breathe underneath her chin. The girth on a harness doesn't actually have to be very tight. Uh, when you're sitting in a saddle, the girth is what, you know, controls your body weight and the stirrups and all of that jazz. But on the harness, it's really just to kind of retain things in a line and in a space on the animal comfortably. Um, and actually for logging, which is what we were about to demonstrate, uh, a lot of these components are kind of uh, not even necessary. Um, I'm not going to take them apart and take them off because I don't need them. Although if I was to strictly be logging, I might because they could have a higher potential of getting snagged on things. But um, the most important things for us today are the collar, the hames, the tugs, and then the tugs connect to the chain. And then we'll show you the components that then hook to the log. Try to find the crack in her teeth and try to get it in there. When she's sure it's not too cold, she'll take it. And then to go around the eyes. And then be gentle with her ears. And that way it's just a more pleasant experience for her. Also, her beautiful mane. We'll get that all cleared out. And it's all very familiar. The reins will allow us to control the horse and steer them by putting light pressure on either side. The horse is trained to respond to that light pressure and also to brake them by giving pressure on both sides. Uh, also, we always want to start with the subtlest cue. The subtlest cue is our vocal cue. So we might tell them the different commands, which are whoa, to stop, uh, get up in order to giddy up, in order to get going, um, walk on, which is just to walk forward, uh, step, which would be a single step, Ha, which is the cue to turn left, and then G, which is the cue to turn right. Just about all those commands can be transferred through the reins, but it's subtler and gentler if we can say them first and then have the horse react to that, and then we don't have to be yanking on the animal. And as we get into a better groove, hopefully uh, the relationship becomes more so where we can talk to each other instead of having to uh, force. Um, a important phrase in horse training is ask, tell, make. And that means that the first thing we're gonna do is ask the horse to do what we want. We might ask the horse to walk. Uh, if the horse doesn't walk when we ask them to, then we might tell them to walk. We might flick the rein at them or uh, you know, ask them a little bit louder to walk on. And then finally, if the horse is not responding to us and we're in, the, in an effort to train the horse, in order to be safe, we have to make the horse do what we want. And then we might flick the reins a little harder, maybe come around the front and uh, guide the horse as we give them the direction. But by asking them, we give them a chance to do what we want them to do. By telling them, we remind them a little bit more sternly. And then by making them, we're really reinforcing the training. And the goal is to always do all of this as uh, calmly, comfortably, and safely as possible. So here we have a single tree evener. This is about the third modification iteration 
that I've made up. And the important concepts are that it spreads out the pole among the two tugs, gives the animal some width to work within. Additionally, this one has a handle, so it's easier to work with uh, in the woods. I'm less likely to get my finger caught in there and dragged off. That would be a nightmare. That's something you really want to avoid. Um, also, the swivel is quite important. That way, if the log begins to roll, the whole apparatus doesn't roll, twisting up the horse and hurting them. Uh, but with this, we can connect the harness. We can really connect from this to the tugs, to the harness, to the hames, to the collar. And it allows the animal to transfer the power to the log. You also want to keep it nice and tight. The angle of draft, they call it, from the horse's neck or the collar to the log. The steeper that angle is, the more upward lift you put on the log, and that means less friction. It's easier for the horse to work in that regard. So that's a very uh, important concept. You really want to keep these tight. If you keep the chain long, you're going to have a lot more friction. The end is going to catch a lot more debris, and it's going to be a lot harder for the horse. So if we can get that front end off the ground, it makes it a lot easier for the horse. Here we have a choke chain. And the concept of the choker is that you slip the chain through it, creating a loop, and then the friction tightens. And then the friction against the chain uh, will lock onto the bark of the tree and allow the tree to pull. We can take this choke chain, wrap it around the tree, secure it, and then put it on the single tree or whipple tree. And that is what allows us to pull the log. So when I first got Hildy, she was really more of a cart horse and a little bit of a farm horse. And I really wanted to turn her into a logging horse. And so this is a training log that we kind of pulled out of the woods and left down here to kind of get her acclimated to the tools of the tree. She took to it wonderfully, but it's a little bit deformed. It's a little bit of an ugly log. It's got some beautiful burls on it. I think I cut it years ago thinking I was going to turn the burls, but someday never comes. The other important thing is that you want, when you're pulling on the log, you want to pull over the choker. You don't want to be pulling the opposite way where it's more likely to slip out if things don't go perfectly. So you really just want to spin that choker so that when it's pulled flush against the log and the horse is pulling against the chain, you're pulling in the right direction. Then you want to take your single tree evener and you really want to get that chain nice and tight to the log. You don't want it so close that the log is going to interfere and twist the single tree choker, but that's about where we'd like it for now. Also, I did just check and make sure that this log wasn't frozen into the ground. You never want to set your horse up to fail. And so if the horse is going to be unable to pull the weight, the horse is going to lose confidence in itself. It's going to lose its trust in you, and it's not going to give you the ultimate effort. So you really want to make sure that everything's broken loose, all the limbs have been cut clear, and that your horse can succeed. That way, you're going to have a much better relationship with the horse, and you're going to get a lot more out of the horse. Um, you know, if it's too big, unfortunately, you got to cut that log in half because, you know, if you overwork the horse, they don't understand your goals, and all they understand is what they're capable of and what they're not. So you really have to work with the animal before you, and the more trust the animal has in you, the more you can get out of that animal successfully and for both of your relationship. And, you know, if you overdo things a few times, you can really screw up that trust, that relationship, and then it's going to be very hard to earn that back. So you always want to just set your animal up to succeed. In driving, you really want to stay behind the horse. That's where you have the most control. Whoop. Back. Good girl. Back. Just making sure I'm keeping the reins clear so she doesn't step on them. And then you also, again, you don't want any of the chains to be too long. If you screw up that angle of draft, then the horse is going to have much less efficiency in pulling. Whoa, big girl. I'm just reminding her. She's just stammering a little bit, but safety first. She does stand pretty well. So we really want to make sure that she does well. So even though we don't want the chains too tight, 
we also, uh, excuse me, too loose, we don't want them so tight. The animal needs some room to throw her hooves. We found that three links up on that chain is just about perfect for her to work into the trot and not click her heels on the evener. From a safety standpoint, I'll reiterate a stop command a thousand times and uh, I should only have to use the go command once. She's earnest and willing to work. She's ready to, to do her job. And so it's really important that we just make sure that we have safe control over her, that we don't let her run the show. Uh, as we get more comfortable and a little bit of flow going throughout the day, I'll increasingly let her dictate the pace if I can keep up. But um, you really wanna make sure that you can control that horse at all times, because if you can't, it's a dangerous situation for you. It's a dangerous situation for the horse and uh, you're gonna have unsuccessful outcomes. So. You know, it might seem like I'm being rather stern with her, but really it's just ensuring that we're working safely together and the communication is clear. Uh, I'm gonna start with a nice, easy command, walk on. Good girl. Disconnect the single tree, and then we can disconnect the chain. And we can reconnect the single tree and hitch her back up. So this is just a quick demonstration of the concepts of horse logging. As you can see, Hildy's a little bit disappointed that uh, this is it. This is barely a warm-up for her. But I really just wanted to take a moment in good light in a nice calm setting to show you what's going on so that as you watch videos of us actually pulling logs out of the forest you can appreciate the commands at play the interaction how the power is being transferred how much power it takes for her to do her job so um i hope that this little introduction demystifies a lot of horse logging for you and uh, helps you to appreciate more of what you might see in the future oh walk off good girl team walk off good girl Ha oh, ha! Oh. Easy. Good girl. Whoa! 
Oh. If you enjoyed this video and want to support Hilde in our efforts here at Rugged Ridge Forest, head on over to ruggedridgeforest.com and get a taste of some of our wood-fired organic maple syrup. We really appreciate the support. Thank you. Bye.